like I said, scientific, philosophical ideas and how that affected um, society and culture as far as uh, visual art and uh, literature, uh, even musical compositions go. Um, and then that the, the implications that had that we would see uh, these shifts and changes in ideas going into the uh, uh, 20th century beyond uh, the 19 first couple decades of it. All right, so first uh, let's start off with um, kind of a brief summary of uh, what scientific developments had um, brought to our attention or taught us about um, the world or the world as we thought it existed. So uh, the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment too, uh, but certainly the scientific revolution was established earlier on in the early modern era. In fact, some of the people actually preceded the early modern era, but nonetheless, certainly by the early modern era, um, that scientific revolution had begun and was already underway, which of course helped contribute to the Enlightenment and the use of rationality and, and these visions of progress about you know decreasing suffering uh, and increasing flourishing. Um, getting to the 19th century though, they got a lot more specific uh, views about how the world worked and uh, life got a lot better as a result. So uh, we had kind of a tendency uh, in the 19th century, and this is going to be kind of the theme of the next two or three discussions, is going to be how in the, uh, going into the 19th century, so basically the first half of it, even a, a good chunk of the middle part of the 19th century, uh, so here we go, so uh, early to mid 19th century, and this certainly does, by the way, extend a bit into the late 19th century, but that's where we start to see the change. Uh, you have these very uh, idealistic views. So idealistic meaning uh, views that are almost too perfect, uh, like an ideal world is one that has no suffering, all right, and only flourishing. And a lot of these uh, philosophical beliefs and beliefs even in science at the time were that uh, idealistic versions of reality were achievable uh, and we should uh, pursue them. Uh, and not only that, uh, that were things idealistic, like you could have it as good as possible to the point that you got to like a utopian society. But also there was a single answer uh, for how the world worked. So once we understood the universal laws, um, as, uh, as far as physical sciences go, and once we figure out the universal laws for um, maximizing our social institutions and political institutions to be as logical as possible and allow the maximal freedom uh, that there was first of all one single way to do that and there was one single way to make everybody maximally happy uh, that's sort of what a, a objectivity is or an objective truth is like this thing is true no matter who is answering the question so like for example not that this is actually objectively true but um, if you were to ask a Christian what, uh, what objectively the meaning of, uh, of life is and, and how to be happy and, and what to, to, to aim for, uh, they'd all have a similar answer having to do with like what you should be doing on earth and that the goal is you know uh, achieving uh, forgiveness and, and, and heaven. And, and every religion has an answer like that, whether it's Hinduism, Islam, whatever it might be. It's like, oh, you do these things regardless of who you are and uh, that gives you this reward, uh, particularly the theological ones in the next life. Uh, that's kind of what they focus on, either escaping the uh, cycle of reincarnation if it's more Eastern oriented, um, or you know, living for a, a maximal, maximally optimal uh, uh, community and social order, like if you're Confucian, and then uh, if you're more monotheistic uh, with the Judeo-Christian beliefs, it's again, li live some sort of life to uh, uh, please God and, and go to heaven. That's like the ultimate goal. They believe that's the objective truth for everybody. And if you don't believe in that and live a different life, it doesn't matter, you're still gonna suffer the same consequences later on, whether it means you keep getting cycled into reincarnation or your society disestablishes itself into chaos, or uh, if you're in that monotheistic Judeo-Christian belief that you're just gonna go to hell, right? They all, they all believe that's the way it is. It doesn't matter if you believe that's true or not. It doesn't matter where you are, when you were born, who you are. Uh, that is how the world works no matter what. Uh, that's going to be called into question, too. So that's what we mean by objective uh, truth or reality. We'll stick with truth for now. Objective truth. Again, that means it doesn't matter who you ask. It doesn't matter when you ask it. Uh, it is always going to be true. And they thought that was true in science uh, as far as universal laws go. And they thought that was true with, like, a meaning to life as far as how to make people happy 
uh, and what the meaning in life is, what you should be trying to do or what you have to try to do. Otherwise, the end result is gonna be this consequence or this consequence. And obviously, uh, they preferred the consequence that was uh, not suffering, essentially. That's what direct objective truth means. So when we're going into the 19th century and even in the mid, partially the late uh, 19th century, I meant to say 19th, I guess I said 18th. Um, that's sort of the dominating set of perspectives. And what we're gonna find here is, as we move past the mid 19th century uh, towards the late 19th, early 20th century, that shifts, uh, and not just randomly either, by the way, based on a certain set of beliefs and findings, both scientifically, philosophically, philosophically and psychologically, which we can really just sum up as scientifically as well, but nonetheless. Uh, so that uh, late 19th to early 20th century tr transition, uh, things are gonna change. Um, shifting from these idealistic views of a future, future of a perfect future world uh, to one that is more realistic and grounded, meaning, hey, it's not just all good and, uh, there's probably not a way to have uh, perfection as far as everyone being happy and nobody suffering. Um, and certainly the world that they're in then and even now today uh, is not perfect or ideal yet. Yes, sure, might be, maybe it's improving um, you know, on, on the grounds of, of what enlightenment progress is as far as human flourishing or even just say life, the, the flourishing of life uh, and then a decrease in suffering, but it's not going to be perfect. There's always attributes of it uh, that are imperfect, like uh, uh, the impoverished, or parts of the world that um, do not have access to some of the um, technological innovations that make life easier. Uh, so that's going to be a theme, but also uh, subjective truth is going to become uh, prominent. Meaning, uh, certain philosophers and psychologists, and, and, and this will grow as time goes on, but the early uh, questioners of these beliefs uh, started saying, actually, uh, we don't believe that there's one single uh, way to make someone happy, or there's one single way that you have to live to give meaning. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna actually suggest correctly that it varies depending on the per person as well as their uh, circumstances, what, what they're born into, um, and then of course now with psychology we know that genetics plays a big role in that as well, and so do environmental factors like exposure to hormones in the womb. Uh, and onward in life, and then you've got all, all kinds of factors. And then, of course, society itself has a, a much smaller, but still um, uh, plays a role that does actually end up shaping, at least partly, uh, who you end up being. So uh, that's going to be the shift. And uh, we are much more here nowadays, uh, realistically, uh, than we were back then. And this is where we're going to see that shift. So let's talk about, first of all, why we have these beliefs and then we'll talk about how we got here. And then, finally, we'll talk about how that was reflected in society regarding um, uh, the arts, whether it's literature, visual art, or, or, or compositions, uh, as those different movements sort of shift with these understandings of the world philosophically uh, and scientifically. So let's do um, scientifically, at least first. Um, so here are some reasons to think that uh, scientific, We'll say optimism um, because they genuinely believed they were uh, figuring out uh, how to uh, objectively figure the world out, how exactly everything worked for everyone at all places at all times, uh, and how to make that maximally idealistic. Uh, so we had some clues that we were getting closer. And by the way, um, before I you know move from here to here and, and trash all these views, let me first say, and I'll say this a couple more times too, that. Um, all the things I list here are definitely going to be good things, and they're all true. Um, it's just not that they're not always true is, is going to be the, the point to be made here. So all of these things I'm about to list off about things we know about the world that we're in and, and how life's getting better for, for humans and then increasingly non-humans as well, um, that's still true, and that's still rapidly um, improving in, into the 20th and 21st century. So that doesn't stop. In fact, it keeps going. But again, the, the key here is going to be, yes, those things are wonderful, but they're not always true at all times for every person, and they're certainly not perfect in that um, they are definitely examples of, of, of un, unnecessary suffering. All right, so let's do, uh, let's focus on the optimism. So 
One of the first major reasons to be optimistic about how we understood the world was, and this is going back to the scientific revolution, uh, was our understanding of, uh, of classical mechanics. Uh, that meaning basically how the uh, universe works, how it operates, uh, what laws it abides by. And I don't mean like laws people make, I mean like, you know, the laws of gravity, like, oh, if I drop this, it's going to fall. I always know it's going to. Uh, and in fact, you know, they figure out that you can calculate exactly how fast it's going to fall, um, as long as you know that the, um, um, uh, the pressure and the, and the altitude and the density and all that, you can figure those variables out and you can calculate it uh, perfectly. Uh, in fact, sometimes it's known as uh, Newtonian uh, mechanics because he created uh, the vast majority of them, at least the initial ones. Um, so these were basically universal laws Universal meaning they, uh, they are always true at all times everywhere, or at least they thought so, um, about how the world uh, functions. And lo and behold, they're right, at least um, in the plane of existence uh, and the size and speed that we're moving, they are absolutely true. In fact, they're true for the majority of it. Uh, what we're gonna find out though is when you get to the extremes, as far as size and speed goes, um, that uh, these actually break down. But you know, for our world that we're in, that we can realistically exist in, uh, they certainly are true. So here's some examples. Um, we uh, definitely understood the laws of gravity. Uh, there are series of calculate. Uh, there's a there's formulas for figuring out exactly how motion works. Uh, actually, I should put that too. By the way, uh, motion uh, slash inertia laws. So you can actually calculate these things. You, can, you could calculate exactly um, how the size of an object dictates the gravitational force it'll have, what the pull of that gravitational force will be, uh, what kind of acceleration that'll cost when it, or, or uh, create when it, when it catches onto an object, um, how motion works, how you use energy to move, um, all of those things that they were, they were all able to understand. Uh, they able to understand uh, temperature and pressure, Uh, and then as far as like actual mechanics go, uh, they were, you know, figuring out how to use things like uh, levers and machines to do um, repetitive intensive labor that, that humans were traditionally doing. So we're, you know, increasingly replacing people with machines, All right? So we've got mechanization. Uh, that's absolutely improving things. And a lot of that is predicated on these uh, laws here. Another major one too was a uh, discovery by a guy named John Maxwell. Um, and, and his findings are based off of the findings of previous experiments. Uh, essentially what they discover here is, and, and he consolidates, is that light is uh, it's a wave. In fact, it's, uh, it's an, an electromagnetic wave. So it's a combination of, of, of oscillating waves of electricity and magnetism. And that's exactly how light works and electricity works. And that's how you can learn to manipulate and use electricity. Um, and in doing so, we can use magnets to create it. And that's how we largely begin to uh, create electric, electric power. And then uh, we can uh, figure out how to distribute it outward uh, to power our machines and, and, and lights and things like that later. Um, so he wasn't the one that discovered that it was a wave, but there are many, many other experiments that confirmed its wave-like uh, behavior. Uh, but he's the one that consolidated the uh, uh, electromagnetic uh, relationship and that all light is just varying degrees of this electromagnetic uh, uh, these electromagnetic waves. So um, John Maxwell, uh, electromagnetism. And a brief example, I'm probably going to draw this very well, but um, so electricity moves in waves, we found that out. Um, and in fact, that's all light is, it's varying frequencies of this uh, electricity combined with uh, magnetism. So that would be something like, I'm going to do this really, really badly. So if that's what a um, electricity wave looks like, then the mag magnetism, the, the magnetic field that goes along with it, which is much smaller, by the way, so it's not in proportion what I'm drawing, but it oscillates in a perpendicular fashion. So like, if the uh, electric wave is going this way, the, um, uh, if it was going this way, the uh, magnetic wave would be going perpendicular this way. So they'd be uh, generating together like this, to the camera, uh, and I'll try to draw that. Um, I don't know if I'll be able to, but it's something like this. I'm 
not doing this very well. Let's see how it comes out. So it's something like this. Um, so if these are vertical waves, uh, these would be horizontal waves. I kind of did that a little bit. Nonetheless, they figured that out, right? So now that we know that, uh, we can now use magnets to create electricity. And like I said, distribute that uh, from power plants or power sources to power machinery and lights. And that really changes our world uh, quite a bit. And since we understand uh, how gravity and motion works, we can actually create and design things that uh, do a lot of the unnecessary human labor for us, uh, whether it's uh, using sewers and, and creating them in a way so that, um, that they uh, kind of self-run as far as drainage goes. And, uh, we also figure out um, uh, how to, to manipulate light um, and bend it to uh, see much smaller um, uh, images than, than are possible with the, with the naked eye. Um, so like, you know, telescopes, of course, uh, zoom you out on a large scale, and then microscopes are going to, of course, bring it down to the very small and magnify the very small. Um, so these are all things that we begin discovering. I'm going to come back to this because this actually has one problem left in it that kind of leads us to this next uh, jump, but let's keep going with the uh, the positive developments. So uh, we got electromagnetism down. Um, we also uh, have figured out, and again, this one's not entirely correct, but at least they knew they existed. They believed at the time they sort of discovered atoms, or at least theorized them. Uh, atoms and molecules, basically that molecules are combined atoms. So atoms specifically are the uh, smallest. Uh, particle unit. And they believe that all uh, heat and, and light and electromagnetism came from just basically um, these vibrating uh, little particles called atoms. And they're not entirely wrong about that, uh, but they are wrong that uh, that's solely what causes the um, energy and light. And that um, they're also going to be incorrect that uh, the uh, it can be any frequency because it is it actually cannot and we'll, we'll talk about that and that's how they uh make the jump from classical mechanics or newtonian mechanics all the way to uh the new stuff uh, quantum mechanics which is way 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 different and special relativity all right <clears throat> so they discover these things and uh that's all well and uh or fine and well but like what do they actually do with these things to uh to uh, make life uh, better so they're trying to figure out this is exactly how all the fundamental parts of the universe work in fact as they were getting towards the end of the 18th or 19th century, uh, this is basically physics here, uh, they were sort of uh, suggesting to uh, young scientists, oh, you should probably not go into physics because there's not that much left to discover. We've almost got it already with Newton's uh, discoveries and Maxwell's discoveries and, and, and others. Uh, we've almost got it. You should go into something that is, um, has more work to be done like biology or chemistry or, or one of the other branches. Um, little did they know that there was still plenty to be found out here. Um, so what are they doing with this stuff? Uh, it's great that we know it, but, but how, are we, um, how are we progressing with it towards an idealistic society? Uh, and again, like I mentioned before, these things are definitely improvements. These things are true um, as far as how the world works that we're interacting with at the speed and size that we are. Um, and that's the case for most of the universe, but for most places, uh, they're not entirely true. Nonetheless, these, the list I'm going to make here, I'm, almost all humans could agree, uh, are good things. These are progress. These are, um, these are beneficial things that most people would agree are, are good. All right, so uh, some examples would be, uh, these obviously, since we know how the world works, we can now use these fundamental laws to our advantage to create machines or ways of making life better. So let's start out with... Um, Things that get better. We have uh, higher standards of living. We'll get into that, what that means. Uh, we have a population increase. There's a couple factors there. Um, that's obviously a good sign of flourishing. Less people are, are, are dying, at least more than are living. Uh, in fact, I should mention that as a separate category. Uh, mortality rates improve. So less people die prematurely. You know, before old age sets in and they die of some uh, relatively natural set of causes uh, or even accidents, but even those are going to decline as time goes on. So we have uh, more people are, there's more food available, so we have a population increase, but also less people are dying because we understand what's making people die 
up increasingly as this 19th and early 20th century go on. Um, what else do we have here? We have um, uh, urban life increases, uh, improves dramatically. And we, we won't go through all of the uh, examples here, but um, here are certainly some good starting points. So standard of living, what do I mean by that? I mean, um, if I were to compare a person who in 1890 was poor to a person who was poor in, let's say, uh, 1290, 600 years earlier, um, the life of the poor person in 1890, who is comparatively just as poor uh, in their current 1890 uh, uh, setting to somebody who is like, let's say, percentile wise, out of 100 people, they're the third most poor on average, okay? So if I take that third most poor person I averaged and I look at their life in 1290 compared to 1890, there's a major difference um, in that there's more stuff available to the person in 1890 that makes their life better even though they are poor. Um, so what do I mean by that? Um, I mean, by the way, you can use that same uh, comparison now to somebody in 1890 and the difference is just insane. Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, you've got more access to necessities. So in the 1890s, even if you are poor, uh, food is way cheaper uh, to purchase. So in 1290, if I was very, very poor, any sort of hiccup in the economy or famine or drought, whatever, you, whatever there might be, um, if I'm the third most poor person on average, I'm probably dead. Uh, I'm probably going to starve or my immune system will be compromised because I'm not gonna have food, I'm gonna die of some disease that I wouldn't normally die of. But because uh, machinery has allowed me to collect food and, and, and preserve it for longer and produce it in much higher quantities, uh, the laws of, uh, of supply and demand dictate that it's gonna be much cheaper and much more widely available. So even if I have less money than 97% of people, uh, I still can buy much more than a comparatively poor person 800 years ago in, in 1290, but again, if I'm an 1890 person. So access to uh, necessities like food and water. I'm much less likely to die of random things because there's more knowledge about how the world works um, as far as like uh, germs, and that's, I can actually probably dip that into here, but in fact, I, in fact, I will actually. Uh, well, I'll leave it. Um, if I live in the city, let's say in 1890, uh, New York, whatever it might be, Chicago or, or, or London, wherever it is. I'm probably not too happy if I'm a poor, like I said, like the third percentile poor in 1890, but I still have access to a lot of things that people didn't in the 1290s. So am I going to have public lighting in the 1890s in most major cities? Yes, I will. So that's an improvement. Um, there are public spaces available that weren't in the 1290s that are, are in the 1890s. So I can go to things like parks and theaters, and um, I can go to... Uh, libraries, public libraries uh, are starting. Uh, public schooling is starting. So even if I am a poor kid or a poor family, my kid's still gonna get an education. Uh, so these things are increasingly available to people. Um, so I got more access to education, uh, lighting. This is, by the way, where water starts becoming um, uh, available to the public on, in like fountains and things like that, and not just like water they would die from, but they actually understand, oh, there's bacteria in it. We should find a way to clean it, which they do with you know, chlorine and things like that eventually. Um, running water uh, is, is starting to become more popular. It's not everywhere. It's not until like 1950s or 60s that it starts becoming almost universal in households um, in the West. But that is increasingly available. So there's all kinds of standards of living that go up. And then um, there's more uh, cool little gadgets and things to buy. Um, I can more readily uh, purchase... Uh, things that might not be good for you, but might be enjoyable. Um, things like uh, access to alcohol, tobacco, things like that. They're cheaper, they're more available, uh, and you can find them. So there's a lot more available for uh, leisure activities. Like I said, whether that's libraries or parks or, or, or things that might not be good for you health-wise, but um, enjoyable, you can certainly get your hands on if you want to for cheap. All right, population is going to increase quite a bit because we have a lot of improvements uh, in agriculture. So... Um, these aren't going to be quite the scale uh, of what's going to later be in the Green Revolution uh, in the 20th century. That really, uh, you have that huge hockey stick spike in population, but we do get a pretty good start uh, or, or upward trend in that hockey stick 
in the 19th century here. And a lot of that's because of uh, food is much more uh, widely available to people. So it's much cheaper, as we already mentioned up here, uh, cheaper food. Because that mechanization process, those sort of early proto-tractors are, are becoming available, or certainly wheat threshers, uh, machines that do that. Uh, I can also transport food much more easily and cheaply uh, because I have access to railroad cars um, and steamships. And we are starting to understand how things decay. Basically, heat makes food decay quicker as far as um, being able to foster bacteria and growth. Um, so we discover that if you cool things or freeze them, uh, they last longer. We also discover there are some uh, compounds that can function effectively as preservatives, which prevent things from breaking them down, make them resistant to bacteria, whatnot. Um, I don't actually know what any of them are. I want to say there's some form of phosphor, phosphor or sulfide, or, but I don't know the chemistry behind it, so I'm not going to make it up. Uh, nonetheless, we figure out various compounds, uh, you know, early things like salt, things like that, and, and more advanced ones uh, chemically. Uh, we figure out preservatives to make food last longer. Uh, we develop, uh, they're called ice boxes or ice trucks, but that really just means insulated rail cars or, or, or cargo holds that maybe have ice in them or whatever and, and keep them as cool as possible so you can actually transport things um, over long distances that would otherwise go bad. Like if you just loaded up a um, railroad car full of, um, you know, let, let's say freshly butchered uh, meat, it would, any trip it would go bad essentially, but if you put it into an ice box uh, on these rail cars, it's, it's much more likely to last um, while transporting in a city or between cities or whatever it might be. So for pres preservatives, ice boxes or, or, or trucks, all make food much more widely available. Um, so we have more food, that's also bring the price of it down, which we mentioned earlier, uh, and the mechanization process also aids that. So food can uh, last longer, travel further, and it's cheaper, uh, so we're gonna have a population growth there. Mortality rates improve, so people die prematurely less often uh, because of some uh, discoveries we have. Now, we haven't really gotten to the point that we're discovering that um, we should probably make factories and railroads and policies more safe um, so that those guys that used to stop trains by hopping between railroad cars and um, hitting the brakes manually that would you know, one out of ten of them in their lifetime would just end up falling and dying on the railroad tracks. Uh, we discovered that, ah, that's not just, you know, um, bad luck, that's bad design. So then we would, you know, start banning things like having those rail car jumpers that stop brakes. You'd have to have automatic brakes that uh, are electrically powered uh, and go, and that saves lives too. But uh, we're not getting there yet. Mortality's going to improve because we start discovering some basic fundamental things having to do with these scientific uh, uh, laws and universal laws and discoveries. So one example is we discover uh, bacteria. Uh, we don't fully understand them yet, and we don't have antibiotics yet either, so bacteria are still dangerous, but we are aware of them. That's a big game changer, because now we know we need to uh, properly clean things before we eat them or dispose of them. Uh, otherwise, we are going to infect ourselves with these bacteria, and again, we don't know what they all are yet or what they all do, but we do know that these microorganisms are, or at least the theory is that's what's making us sick. Uh, so once we're aware of them, we can much better avoid them. And again, no antibiotics yet, so if you would get infected, it's like, well, we hope, we hope you beat it, but um, at least this way you're exposed to them a lot less. So if I get a cut, I should clean the cut. If I'm gonna have some water or some food, I should make sure that food is uh, cooked or boiled uh, fully so I don't ingest a bunch of microorganisms, potentially uh, pathogens, whether it's, whether it's viruses, uh, or bacteria and die. So uh, we know about bacteria's existence and we start developing chemicals that could uh, uh, fight them. So you have bleaches. They de uh, discover that chlorine, uh, uh, for whatever reason, uh, doesn't allow bacteria to develop as easily. So you can uh, chlorinate water supplies minimally so as not to poison the humans, but also not to allow bacteria to grow. Um, and then of course, the most simple one, you can just boil water. Heat kills the bacteria. So boil your water before you use it and that'll kill the uh, bacteria. And we've already been cooking meat for a long time, and we knew that if you cooked it, you were less likely to get sick, but now we know why. Uh, so uh, cooking meat becomes much more, uh, much more highly emphasized, I guess you'd say. Funny story, the English actually believed that tea was what made them not get sick. Like it somehow purified their, their system and got rid of all these toxins or, uh, or, or evils, whatever it might be, and that's why 
the English once they started drinking tea in mass from uh, from East Asia, um, sometime in the late modern, early modern era, and in this modern era, uh, they actually discovered no, it wasn't tea that did it. It was just the fact that they boiled the water first um, and that was killing the bacteria, so they stopped getting you know things like dysentery and cholera and things like that as as often. Those are, by the way, slow, terrible deaths, um, usually based on dehydration by um, uh, excessive diarrhea, so not, not an enjoyable one. All right, <clears throat> and then uh, we also have urban life's going to improve. So because we have population growth, and because increasingly those jobs are not on farms, because um, it's becoming increasingly mechanized, it's more so going to be focused in the cities, uh, particularly industrial cities. And in the 19th century and early 20th century, most industrial cities, ones of the factories that produce stuff, we're in the West, so that's back when uh, places like London, well, London was kind of a financial city even then, but uh, eh, we'll say London. Uh, London, uh, Chicago, New York, San Francisco even. Uh, it still has the title, actually, on the South Hills of San Francisco. If you're, if you're driving up from the South from the peninsula, uh, you'll see these old letters on this like brown dead hill that say the industrial city, which is a joke because there's almost no uh, manufacturing and production going on there anymore. It's pretty much all um, uh, knowledge economy stuff. Nonetheless, um, people flocked these industrial cities because that's where the jobs were, that's where the factories were, uh, etc. Initially, fact, uh, uh, city life sucked and it wasn't perfect by the uh, even by the late 19th century, early 20th century, but it was way better uh, than it was in the early modern era or even the 18th century. So city life is going to be a new improve. Now, it's still a bit chaotic uh, because, again, they're not highly developed yet. So, like, for example, there really aren't many traffic laws. So, like, uh, pedestrian deaths uh, by car crash were insanely high or horse trampling because people just kind of drove around randomly. And if you ever watch old videos, not that you ever will, but if you ever watch old videos of, like, uh, city footage, like those ones they turn to color and look really crazy um, with their, with their uh, 4K cameras now, uh, it's just a mad dash. People are like running through the streets avoiding cars and uh, there's not really a, there's kind of a direction as far as right and left for traffic, but people are going around horses and people and it, it's kind of crazy. There's no signal lights, there's no real stop signs. Uh, there are on the busy intersections, you know, those, those um, traffic, uh, um, what are they, signalers, they're not the traffic signalers. Traffic managers, I forget what they're called. Uh, those people uh, guiding traffic. Uh, but city life does improve, and what I mean by that is uh, because of our discoveries of electricity and wiring, uh, and then you know Edison and, and Tesla and others making lots of discoveries with electricity and as far as how to use lights, uh, we are actually able to have lighting in cities, and public lighting too, not, not like, you know, you gotta pay for it. No. Cities are well lit now, so uh, that does help decrease crime, uh, and it helps also decrease accidents and, and allows people to live a nightlife because they can actually see. So businesses can now open at night, people can do um, and enjoy other uh, extracurricular activities after dark in cities because of this lighting, so that's an improvement for most people. Um, you also have uh, sewage systems. Thank God they finally got those. Um, Having the uh, knowledge of bacteria and the uh, viable sewer systems alone uh, drastically improved the mortality rates because people got sick far less often uh, with having a lot less human waste around and, and eating and drinking a lot less uh, spoiled uh, food and water. Uh, really improved people's lives, uh, just to that alone. But yeah, sewage systems uh, in cities were a massive, massive, massive improvement. It's no more uh, uh, dumping buckets um, out, of the, uh, out of windows and, and, and going in the streets and leaving uh, horse droppings and, and things like that all over the place. Now we had sewer systems. They even started a garbage collection, like city garbage collection began here in the early 20th century. Um, so there weren't just these massive pile heaps. Um, example, if you want to know what I'm talking about, you can look up some videos, because uh, currently in some places in South Asia and Southeast Asia and, and Africa and Latin America, some cities don't have that, those trash, um, city trash uh, networks. Uh, and uh, man, the cities are just completely uh, littered, man. And I mean litter, like mountains of garbage, and it just looks completely toxic. Uh, and, and it is, I mean, people getting sick all the time. Uh, and those are getting better, obviously, as, as, as those regions slowly begin to modernize because of free trade, which we'll get to in period uh, four. Uh, but nonetheless, this starts to occur. Uh, and not only does it Im improve as far as lives go, but it actually gets more enjoyable, too. I mentioned the, the, the nightlife at night, but also, too, we have access to a lot more uh, public um, uh, uh, leisure activities and venues. So you have um, uh, parks, 
um, per unit of developed city. They start getting city codes where like, you know, for every how square miles of, of, of buildings you have, you have to have this many square miles of, or square footage of, uh, of parks. So city parks become a thing. So like um, um, Central Park in New York City, uh, these become projects where people are not wanting to become trapped in these giant industrial jungles. They want at least certain areas designated to be uh, green. And most of them, of course, are also going to be public uh, so, and, and managed by the city to be kept relatively uh, clean uh, or, or cut, not just like uh, a, a barren lot of, of untreated land that just turns to weeds or, or, or garbage or whatever. So uh, parks uh, become a thing. You also have access to things that started earlier but are now more more popular and cheap. So things like museums, operas, those were kind of on the decline though. Theaters, the reason why is because uh, pretty quickly here we have uh, photo photography and, and then eventually videos. Uh, so those eventually turn into uh, cinemas. Um, libraries, public libraries begin. Library. Uh, and not that this is specific to cities, but we do also, like I mentioned up here, have access to uh, public education. So these are all uh, absolutely um, optimistically positive developments uh, and signs that, hey, our increasing knowledge of how the world works uh, is leading towards this uh, uh, um, more idealized uh, society or, or, or this progress that's making human lives better. And again, they believed that they were figuring out exactly how the world works right down to the T, uh, where whatever these discoveries are, they apply here in all places at all times, exactly the same, uh, and we can use those to uh, create sort of a perfect um, uh, society as far as progress and, and moving towards it, but also um, uh, lives as far as decreasing suffering and increasing human flourishing. Uh, and this sort of optimistic view is going to uh, bleed into a, a, a system of views, or I should say a, a philosophy actually, known as positivism. And I'm running out of time here, uh, and I have some footage of just before the, the, the COVID-19 um, uh, 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 quarantine. Uh, where I talked with my class about it, so we'll, I'll, I'll cut over to that to, to, to cover it. But basically, and, and uh, you'll get a lot more detail in the next few minutes of, uh, of, a, of a previous clip, but positivism basically believed that um, this scientific approach, uh, so applying uh, that sort of enlightenment emphasis on rational thought, rationality, logic, slash logic, uh, plus science, or I should say the scientific method, uh, was the way to go, that, that these things combined could figure out exactly how the world worked, figure out the fundamental laws that applaud everywhere at all times and all speeds and all locations, uh, and then we could use them to create a perfect society that was devoid of suffering. Um, we're going to have some philosophers, of course, that call that into question and, and, and call out that that's an impossibility, and psychologists, early psychologists. Uh, and we're also going to have some science that shows that is definitely not the case because these are not all applicable at all times, in all places, at all speeds. Um, but that's kind of what this positivism uh, believes. So you have uh, roughly from the late uh, 18th century, the late 1700s, to uh, a little past the mid, we'll say mid to late 19th century. Uh, some of these views become quite popular. In fact, a guy named Auguste Comte is one of the uh, main codifiers of this set of beliefs. Uh, they believe that you could use uh, rationality and logic plus the scientific method uh, to figure everything out essentially and move towards objective truth in, a, in, a, in an idealized uh, utopian world. Um, I wouldn't say that they said it will inevitably be a utopian, but that was the way to do it and it was possible uh, to use the, these features uh, to move towards that. Uh, furthermore, they argued, by the way, that these should be used, but what should we get rid of then? Uh, they believe we should get, be getting rid of uh, theology, that these supernatural explanations for the world and afterlives and, and, and gods and reincarnation, whatever it might be, whatever religion uh, you or theology you adhere to, that that was not the way to uh, figure out how the world worked uh, objectively and find out what the meaning to that is. And they also wanted to reject uh, metaphysics which was basically trying to understand knowledge and reality and being and other abstract concepts like time and space 
uh, as if those things were not real uh, or irrelevant, um, or at least not ways to achieve this. And that uh, through the use of these two things, uh, that would enter into this sort of positive phase uh, where we, we basically use sociology to, to use these elements to figure out how to construct a, a perfect world where uh, no one is suffering, and then also a world that is, uh, allows for maximum liberty and individualism uh, and has minimal sort of constraints on people. Um, so while they're going to be totally wrong in that, uh, uh, that this is achievable, they are going to be correct that we can use these tools uh, to create better lives. And, and we, we continue to do that to, to, till this day. Like, if you look at, and there's a whole bunch of graphs um, that I have, if you have my PowerPoints, or if you ever uh, have heard of or, or, or read the works of a guy named Steven Pinker, uh, in his book Enlightenment Now, uh, or, or The Blank Slate. Well, that one's not really as relevant to what I'm talking about. Uh, Enlightenment Now, his most recent one, uh, or uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, those were all written recently. Uh, and he talks about how, uh, no, these aren't all objectively true and, and, and certainly not possible to reach this utopian world, but we can definitely utilize these concepts and um, the other discoveries that we make later about special relativity and quantum mechanics and other scientific uh, discoveries. Uh, to continue this process of getting, uh, of, of, of adding to progress that is increasing uh, flourishing for, for humans and, and extending to non-humans uh, increasingly, uh, and also to reduce uh, unneeded suffering. Uh, and that is absolutely true. We can continue this process, and we have. And if you look at any marker uh, for human well-being, uh, even animal well-being, but certainly human well-being, uh, they have all improved dramatically ever since we started using um, this approach of using the scientific method and rationality logic uh, to try to figure out the, practically figure out the, uh, the world we inhabit the best that we can uh, and use it um, to try to promote the most uh, good. And by good, I mean progress again, decreasing human suffering and, and increasing human flourishing. We've done that. Wars dropped, violence has dropped all astronomically in the last two or three years, ever since the enlightenment and scientific revolution sort of um, uh, provided these, these uh, perspectives and approaches, uh, and it's just continuing. Um, hopefully it continues down. Of course, there's some snaking on graphs as far as uh, violence or, or bigotry or, or uh, any other marker of suffering, whether it's mortality rates or it's uh, life expectancy. Like, he's got like, oh man, there's just probably between the two books, there's probably over 200 graphs that pretty conclusively show that Every single marker that we can think of for like what's a life that has less suffering, they're all just getting better. And again, there is some snaking, and that doesn't mean that because that the the trend for these graphs is uh, in the positive direction, whether it's decreasing suffering or increasing flourishing, it doesn't mean that they're going to keep going that way. But uh, we're on the right path for making it closer uh, to a a, a more optimal uh, world. So again. What we talk about in the next section, don't think that it just completely destroys this and it's not usable and we should give up on that and it's a joke. No, uh, these are absolutely great fundamentals uh, to combine with the next set of beliefs that we have and we should still continue this process of trying to um, reduce poverty and suffering and necessary, uh, or sorry, unnecessary suffering and death throughout the world and, and extend that to non-humans and, uh, and preserve the, the environment and world that we have. Uh, and we can, and these are the best ways to do it. It's just that, not all of this is objectively true at all times and all places. And um, it's impossible, probably impossible, to create an idealistic world because uh, what we know about psychology and the way humans are, that unless we're genetically engineering people, um, there's going to be a wide range of variants as far as what can and can make people happy or fulfilled and for how long each person can. Uh, so it's way more complicated than just, all people want this. And so if they have this, they're great. That's not exactly uh, how it works. And, uh, Dostoevsky and, and, and Nietzsche tear that down pretty good. In fact, they suggest that if you did provide uh, this world here, this idealist, or at least Dostoevsky does, that uh, people would destroy it just because it was, was boring, that they wanted some sort of challenge uh, to overcome. And if it was perfect, they would intentionally uh, sabotage it just so they would have something to recreate and, and do, essentially. All right, but that's uh, essentially it. So uh, the next one we'll talk more about positivism. And then um, for the uh, uh, next series that we talk about, we'll talk about how um, science and then uh, philosophy uh, broke these down, or sorry, I should say broke these down, broke these down and actually uh, uh, 
moved towards these as, um, as, as perspectives uh, or perceptions and then how that affected society at large as far as culture goes with uh, the, the arts. Okay, last topic, positivism. Um, this is a kind of philo philosophical idea that gets a lot more, that develops in the late 19th century. I probably should have kept that chart up, but oh well. Um, this is the idea that human beings are on this pathway to progress and kind of utopia, <coughs> right, as far as like a perfect society goes. So uh, one of the big proponents of this was uh, Auguste Comte, but he's not the only one. And he's also a historicist. What do historicists believe again, by the way, about history? History is actually leading up to a perfect society. Yeah, it goes in stages uh, to get to some perfect uh, optimal uh, point or progress, right? Who else were my historicists? You can just say them. Marx and Engels, right? They were like, oh, okay, so history is just the story of a struggle over pro po poverty. <coughs> poverty. Pover Damn, I can't even say it. Property, not poverty. Uh, and they're like master slaves, patricians, slaves, all the way up to where they were. Uh, Comte does a similar thing. Um, he believes that human beings, of course, were mostly primitive before. They had no idea how the world worked uh, for a long time. And then they uh, got to a new stage of life where they started piecing the world together better than primitive people had. Primitive people didn't know what the hell was going on. They thought, you know, what did they think? They thought they had to like sacrifice things to volcanoes and you know they they prayed to the sun and things like that they had no idea what was going on they were just guessing all right um but there is a point where humans are still not correct but they're closer to being correct and they're more organized so what phase could i define that as and, and then tell me how it fits if you can theological stage so how, how is that different than the than like a primitive um uh, stage of humanity because they had organized religions with set beliefs and traditions? Yeah, they do. So they try to come up with uh, a unified set of beliefs, even though a lot of the religious explanations are not correct. But uh, they try to come up with a system of beliefs that unites people uh, and guides their behavior. And the uh, religions that do well, that spread and, and their civilizations thrive, are ones that had rules that worked well enough to keep people unified and had things like the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you'd have to do unto yourself. That's a good rule that everyone can apply, regardless of religion. Those little things, those little treasures, uh, actually helped civilizations advance, all right? Now, we do know that religions had their problems, like if you were the other religion, you were the devil, and they'd have to kill each other, essentially. And you have plenty of examples of that with religious wars and the Inquisition and all that. But they were a step up from randomly walking around worshiping things in the world. What else? Or what would be next, then? Uh, the metaphysical stage, where people use science and rational thought to explain stuff. What stuff? <laughs> what, what's happening in the world? What's happening in the world? Okay, fair enough. Give me some examples. Like evolution? <clears throat> yeah, evolution would be an example, but we can go earlier than that. In fact, actually, hold on. Before, uh, I'll give you credit for that, by the way. And i got to give you credit for yours. Um, could I put a time frame on this theological stage? If I, if I look at history, could I say, yeah, it kind of ish started here and it kind of ish might have ended or st started ending here? Um, you could say the theological stage ended at the 30 years war. Then... Okay, early modern era, that's when it starts to decline, absolutely. But where would you say that would start? Um, I guess Roman Empire, early Christianity. Mm, you could go earlier than that, but you're closer. Where, where could I put a start to this? I would definitely agree that this is petering out at least. Uh, by, you know, the early modern era. So by the, you know, 16th, 17th century, this is definitely on the decline, right? This is where we start separating church and state. People have different ideas about how the world works that aren't religious. So yeah, you probably could go about that far. I would say probably, and this is where most historians agree, um, that these large-scale religions all developed at very, very close times and then they spread in Afro Eurasia. Uh, it's the same time as like you have Confucius, because there was a point where the Hebrew scholars that made the, the Torah, the uh, people that codified the Vedic religions uh, in India for Hinduism, uh, Confucius and uh, the Zoroastrians were all walking around on the earth at the exact same time, uh, was about the time. So 
the beginning of, if you guys remember this, like the classical era, like six or 500 BCE, when places like Persia uh, and the Greeks, um, uh, China, later Rome, are all starting to develop. So you could say maybe classical era, uh, like six, 700 uh, BC, or sorry, five or 600 BCE to about the early modern period. Uh, and that's a dominant uh, phase. But you also notice that's where human beings really start thriving. Uh, because they're able to form these more complex societies. Okay, so what can we say this metaphysical stage means? Obviously, we've got the centuries here, but like, what's happening here that shifts people's thoughts from, oh, religious explanations to understanding scientific laws about the world and how it works? Scientific revolution. Yep, scientific revolution would be an excellent one. Right, and there's not really a good end date here, but you could say this is largely 16, maybe even earlier. Like Copernicus was certainly earlier, but uh, certainly by the 16th century all the way till about the 18th, maybe 19th century. Okay, so then what's stage three here? So this is again using physical science. So things like uh, physics, like Luton, Luton's, Newton's laws, uh, biology, about how the human body works, um, even when we start getting into chemistry. Um, in the 19th century bacteria theory, all that stuff, explaining how the world works physically, but that doesn't explain, well, it does actually, but it doesn't quite explain yet how uh, we all work. On um, the positive stage where um, it's the understanding of social science and how humans work. Yep, exactly, positive stage. So is it still scientific approach? Yes. It is, right? But it's not based on, um, although it is now in psychology, uh, but it wasn't based so much on physical science and laws, it was more so based on how human beings behaved and interacted. And forming fair systems that allow you to enjoy liberty uh, and allow people to flourish without harming others. So uh, when can we say maybe this one started? You got the answer for that, so I'll go to somebody else. Where, what era might we say this one started with, perhaps, or movement? Um, the Enlightened uh, Universalism? Yeah, Enlightenment. You could just say the Enlightenment is larger where this is gonna start. Uh, and this is, of course, started by and expanded uh, afterwards the Enlightenment, so you would probably say, if you were going into England, maybe the 17th century, but the rest of Europe, you'd certainly say 18th century uh, uh, onward, at least from his perspective, all right? And this is, again, understanding um, social science, and that is, of course, how humans behave and think and feel, human behavior, thought, feelings, etc. All right, that's where psychology starts, by the way. Psychology is a field started in the 1870s, and that's right along the lines of uh, this positivism becoming popular. And I think it was already mentioned that, oh, wait, wait who gave me that answer for the enlightenment? I think it was already mentioned. The whole point is we would utilize these, eliminate them as they became uh, insufficient, and we would utilize these, primarily these two, to uh, reach a utopian society of decreased suffering and increased uh, human flourishing. And we'd use both of these sets of knowledge. This would obviously figure out how the world works, so how we don't get sick, how we you know, can prevent disease or stop it and uh, uh, make you not suffer physically. And this would be, of course, how to make systems that allow people to enjoy maximum uh, fulfillment and happiness without, uh, and liberty without harming or taking away from others. All right, so max physical understanding uh, and then also maximize uh, social understanding and structures right so this is where we say okay we have to make governments that are actually effective right so you gotta have things like constitutions and separation of powers and uh, protection of natural rights and then of course we have to figure out how humans actually behave so we have to see what they do. And that's what psychology is. That's why psychology is so damn interesting because we, at least the way I do it, I think this is the best way to do it. You kind of look at it a little bit historically and you see how these ideas developed and you see how we got to where we are and how we know yeah. what we know about how your brain works, why you feel the way you feel or don't feel the way you want to feel uh, and how others operate uh, and how to best point your life in a direction where you feel like you're living a good, fulfilling uh, life and so is everybody else. That's largely what it's doing.